Hello, I'm Harold Monroe, Editor-in-Chief of the Vancouver Sun and Province, and joining me is Dan Fumano, our city columnist in, in Vancouver. Hi, Dan. Hey, Harold. Hey, so lots of housing news, as always, in Vancouver and, and elsewhere, given the affordability crisis uh, we're seeing. Um, city Council, uh, you talked about it before, but this last week, they unanimously approved a motion to loosen affordability rules for below market units. Uh, first of all, what is in lay terms, what does that mean? And then uh, how did it get unanimous support? So essentially what we're talking about here is there's a city staff had started coming up with a series of programs um, over the last several years. This stretches back uh, a couple of councils, really, um, back to the back to the Vision Vancouver majority days was when these policies were first approved. And what it is, is city staff's attempts to incentivize the private sector to build more of the kind of housing that is kind of more desperately needed. Uh, per, so especially rental housing, so purpose-built rental apartments, and especially uh, below market, so sl more affordable rental homes. So essentially what city staff had done, and this goes back, the first of these programs was approved back in 2017 under Vision Vancouver. And what they what they did, which, and as far as city staff are concerned, they were kind of a leader in Canadians, among Canadian cities with this kind of approach where they were basically giving developers, private sector, for-profit developers, uh, more heightened density in their projects in exchange for reserving a certain percentage of the units and it works out to basically being 20 percent of the residential floor space has to be reserved at below market rents so 80 percent of the units are market rentals 20 percent would be reserved at below market rates and it was a way that city hall was trying to sort of push the private sector to build yeah fewer you know, expensive condos, market condos, and more rental housing, especially below market. The issue, though, is that so there was a big flurry of developer interest in this program initially back in 2017 and around then, but none of these projects have been built to date. What seven, six plus years later, none of them have been completed. Some of them are under construction. Some of them are almost completed, but despite this initial surge of interest a lot of these projects were abandoned basically developers just said they couldn't make the math work even with this extra heightened density even having 80 percent of the units being at market rates they couldn't make it work they couldn't get financing to build the projects in some cases so it wasn't happening um and so anyway that brings us to last week when city staff had come to council and said here's our proposal to loosen the affordability criteria a little bit, which should hopefully make these projects more viable, uh, get some of these, because basically they had calculated that thousands of homes had been approved, but not built. And they well, wanted to see those things starting to yeah. You've written about that, like an approval yes. is not yeah. a house. And there are no. lot, lots of lots of that happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so council went ahead and approved it um, yeah. unanimously, which is, it does seem like um, a bit of a move for some of the people, yep. particularly on the left, uh, center left of, of council. Um, so, so you had people from the center left, you know, the sort of the more. It's not too surprising to see this approval from ABC, considering the ABC majority, the council, the ABC council members have kind of repeatedly said, we want to get a lot more housing of all types, market, non-market, everything. They want to get a lot more built more quickly. So they want to do what they need to do to speed things up, get things built, uh, go from an approval to an actual completed home. So ABC has kind of said that a lot. And some of the things they've approved in some cases have been controversial, um, but they're saying that they want to get homes built. Um, and actually on that note, just last week, you know, they approved looking at this view protection, changing the view protection guidelines, right. uh, which is controversial with some, but they're saying they want to make it easier to get more homes built more quickly. But as you say, it was this measure to change the affordability criteria last week was approved unanimously. And it was like some of the sort of left-leaning councillors who commented on their own conflict. So uh, one city councillor, Christine Boyle, and green councillor, Pete Fry, I remember both of them used the word reluctant. They said they were reluctantly approving this, but they were kind of just taking a pragmatic approach saying, I don't like the idea of making affordable units a bit less affordable but at the end of the day they are still permanently secured at a discounted rate and essentially they were saying 
we just want to see these things get completed. Right. And but really, that's, I mean, some that's, homes... that's a, yeah. To say reluctant, I mean, that's I don't think anybody voted for it enthusiastically. I mean, I would think that yeah. everybody wants to keep rents as low as possible. But as you say, pragmatically, if nobody will build it at that price, then you're you're getting zero value out of a policy like that. Yeah, and, and and again, these are there's thousands and thousands of units that have already gone through this labor intensive, time consuming, expensive process of getting approved at City Hall. So they've got approvals, um, and the, they're just not getting built. And again, in many cases, it's the developers say they can't get financing. Obviously, interest rates and construction costs are at a totally different level now than they were back in 2017, 18, 19, when a lot of these applications first came in. So it's also a reflection of that, the changing market dynamics and the changing environment. Um, so is this going to be, an, I guess we'll have to wait and see whether this is enough to get that's anything done. City staff say they are confident. They think these changes, um, you know, which includes a change to the sort of uh, rent control mechanism to make it easier to increase rents when people move out. Um, they'd still be discounted, but they would be, it'd be easier to increase the rents. Anyway, they are confident from what they're hearing from the development sector uh, and from third party analysis and stuff, they think that these changes will be enough to tip these projects into viability, make it happen. Of course, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, we'll see if that comes to pass. Right. Okay. Obviously it is a challenging environment out there and lots of construction projects are going way over budget. They're being delayed, they're being you know, abandoned. So it's a challenging market out there. Um, to make right. lots of kinds of projects work. So, I mean, th also on the housing front, um, housing minister, BC housing minister, Ravi Kalman announced plans to digitize the building permit process um, in an effort to speed up construction. How will going digital make a difference, say at Vancouver City Hall or in other municipalities? Well, the idea is just to, again, to speed things up, to make things more efficient. Um, you know, in, in today's announcement, it notes that a lot of jurisdictions in BC are still using sort of paper based application processes. Um, and some municipalities have made strides towards digitizing certain parts of the application process. I mean, I can tell you in the city of Vancouver, the biggest city in the province, um, up, you know, up until COVID, it, it was really notable how much of their application process was based on paper. You could walk uh, sort of kitty corner from city hall there's a permits and licensing office and every morning you would see a lineup of people waiting for the office to open holding these tubes with architects drawings and paper drawings mm -hmm. every day they were waiting for the office to open so they could go in get their drawings checked and people in the building industry would say this is crazy this is happening in 2019 2020 anyway covid necessitated um, a certain amount of shifting towards digital digitization, which is also true in other kind of um, some other government institutions, you know, the courts, the courts sure. in BC had, you know, digitized, modernized a little bit because of COVID and health institutions anyway. So uh, anyway, but that brings us to today's announcement. Basically, the province is going to make its own made in BC digital permitting tool that they say they're built, they're working to develop with uh, in cons consultation with a number of municipal governments, uh, one First Nations government, a regional government, I think, or two, and then also they're talking to the industry, the engineering, architecture, uh, mm -hmm. development industry, tech industry sources, and they're trying to develop a digital system that can remove some of the need for humans to check paper plans to ensure they comply with the BC Building Code. And this, there's a bit of a precedent for this work because the city of Kelowna has been pioneering its own um, sort of digital uh, permitting process, which uses artificial intelligence. And they've been doing that for about the past year. We wrote a story about it a couple of months ago, um, and there was great interest in that. A lot of people found it really interesting the way Kelowna had, had a, they massively dropped the amount of time, or they were expecting that they were going to be able to mm -hmm. massively cut the amount of time that it took for just for a standard application, if somebody wants to build something that complies with zoning, they've got a qualified architect and a they've got everything's in order um, to make it just so that a computer program can analyze this instead of having a person go through line by line. And well, and I guess for the, the consumer, for the user as well, if they if they fill out a field incorrectly, 
yes it would it would tell them that it's incorrect and they can yeah. they can change it up and not have to go to the trouble of submitting get it sent back to them and and then wait a few weeks to get control. a response they make a yes they make a change they wait a few weeks to get a response it, it you know a lot of yeah. applicants said that the previous system felt archaic and it didn't right. make sense that we were still using this kind of approach in this day and age so okay. anyway so the province has said they were to, towards that they're trying to move okay. towards that and they, they hope it could start they could start testing it uh by next year okay good good stuff all right well speaking of politics then at city at city hall <laughs> yeah um can you tell us about the two complaints to the city's integrity commissioner by uh, Mayor Ken Sim, uh, both against Councillor Christine Boyle, um, yeah. with different outcomes, but two complaints. Yeah. So yeah, um, we learned about the two complaints basically within days of each other. Typically, we don't know about these complaints until there's some kind of resolution, right? And then a final report is issued. Um, so the first complaint was lodged by the mayor against Councillor Boyle back in early March. And basically, he was complaining that she might have breached the rules around sort of an improper disclosure because she publicly said how she voted during an in-camera meeting. So council regularly has these yeah. meetings that are behind closed doors, or they call them in-camera meetings. Um, most council business or a lot of council business is conducted out in public. You can see how council votes on different matters, but for certain kinds of issues, um, the rules allow them or the rules require them to vote behind closed doors. Now, in this situation, uh, Councillor Boyle had sought advice from the city's legal department, the city manager, saying, and they basically said, she's allowed to say how she voted, but she's not allowed to say how anybody else voted. And the vote itself was around the living wage. The city of Vancouver, for a number of years, had had a commitment that it was going to pay all of its employees and contractors a living wage, but a, an amount, an hourly amount that's calculated by a sort of a third party organization to figure out what is a living wage needed to reasonably live in in Vancouver. Um, she said that she had voted against abandoning the living wage commitment, um, but council had decided to scrap the sort of previously established living wage commitment and create its own calculation for what it would pay its lowest paid employees. So anyway, in that case, the integrity commissioner, Vancouver's integrity commissioner found that Boyle, Councillor Boyle had not broken any rules. She had pursued the advice from City Hall legal and senior management, and she had covered herself off and did not communicate improperly. But the integrity commissioner did find that the city's own policies and guidelines around this could be more clear. And she recommended that the city should maybe clarify and be more consistent um, in what the rules are around what council members can say about in-camera meetings is specifically involving their own votes. So that was the first one. And then the other complaint that we learned about just a couple of days later involved, um, again, it was the mayor filing a complaint against Councillor Boyle. This involved some statements that Councillor Boyle had made around the new head of the mayor's uh, communications, uh, the, the mayor's new communications director, Harrison Fleming. And basically, he had come here after working for um, in Alberta Premier Jason Kenney's office, and then also in the Ontario Conservative uh, government um, under Premier Doug Ford in Ontario. And Councillor Boyle um, had made some comments around the mayor's new hire. Um, and but even before this decision came out this week, and so the the Integrity Commissioner found in this case. Councillor Boyle's, some of her comments were fair comment and other ones crossed the line and were disrespectful. And she said potentially defamatory because she had kind of gone from stating, um, she had called him a bully in one of these things and sort of stated things, presented them as fact when they were sort of opinion or, you know, debatable. Anyway, but Councillor Boyle, even prior to this um, report being concluded and being released, Councillor Boyle had already issued an apology, deleted the offensive tweet, and said that she acknowledged that she crossed a line here. And, um, you know, I think part of the dynamic here is that it's one thing for politicians, elected officials to sort of criticize each other and to criticize, or for anybody to criticize decisions made by elected officials. But in this, it's kind of seen as a little bit different when politicians go after uh, staff, right? Whether it's provincial bureaucrats or municipal staff, 
it's seen a little bit different because staff are kind of in the position where they're seen as they can't really defend themselves. Um, whereas politicians should be debating these ideas with each other. Um, but anyway, I mean, Boyle didn't ignore, didn't say anything about that in her statement. She just said that she crossed the line and she apologized and she regretted it. So after the commissioner's finding and report, the commissioner didn't recommend anything further. She said, you know, there's no need for any further sanction. Councillor Boyle's already apologized and removed the offensive comment. So, so who can file a complaint to the integrity commissioner? Well, I think just about anybody. I mean, often it's members of the public filing complaints. Is that right? right? Okay. Yeah, often. So they, they can file code of conduct complaints. Now, the actual integrity commissioner is a relatively new position in the city of Vancouver. Right. It was just created not that long ago. But code of conduct complaints have, you know, have existed for a long time. I don't remember the last time a sitting mayor was filing code of conduct complaints in Vancouver that were going to a sort of through a full formal investigation. Uh, often these kinds of things will lead to an informal resolution. And then in those cases, often the public never hears about it, right? And so in this case, um, you know, the integrity commissioner in the first complaint noted that she asked Mayor Sim if he would like to just pursue an informal resolution, you know, try to figure out, did Councillor Boyle break the rules by disclosing her vote in the in-camera meeting? Can they go through an informal process? And the mayor declined that. He said he wanted to go for the full investigation and so that's relatively unusual in vancouver it has happened in other municipalities where you have politicians you know going this full going for the full investigation against each other the previous um term uh at least i i can recall just off the top of my head i can recall that at least one sitting councillor filed a code of conduct complaint against uh former mayor so that then councillor colleen hardwick filed a complaint a code of conduct complaint against then mayor kennedy stewart um and that was found to um the mayor was found to have said something improper um and he i think he uh, apologized for it um and i can't remember the details of hand but anyway these, these code of conduct complaints do happen and th there was probably the most important example of it last term was a member of the public filed a code of conduct complaint against a uh, green councillor michael weeb alleging that he had improperly voted on a measure involving patios for bars and restaurants when he himself was a part owner in a restaurant and a bar and he benefited from these changes um and so that went ended up going all the way to the supreme court of bc um because the integrity there was a complaint and so and you know it um weeb wasn't kicked out of office but by his own description it it certainly cost him um, it hurt him in his efforts to get reelected last year. He ran for reelection. He was the only green councillor who was not reelected. And he says, you know, this whole situation um, certainly took away from his ability to campaign and it, it, it was a distraction for him and it, it didn't help him um, in his attempt to get reelected. So that was a, an example of that was filed by members of the public um, okay. about a sitting councillor. So back to the relationship between Sim and Boyle and I guess the mayor uh, generally, when he was elected um, 11 months ago, he spoke a great deal about the need for this new council uh, to work better together across party lines um, than the previous one did. Um, and so now here we are nearly a year later. Um, these two incidents, are, are they at all a reflection on any kind of dysfunction you're seeing on council or, 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 or not? Well, I haven't had a chance to speak with the mayor since news of mm. these um, complaints became public, but I'd like I would like to ask him those questions. I'd be curious what he would say, um, especially because, you know, it seems as though. There's a chance that one or perhaps both of these things might have been resolvable through an informal process that didn't therefore become public. Um, mm. And but he obviously had opted not to do so. And I'm I'm not sure what the reason is. Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, the council meetings in general. Are less acrimonious than they were last term, but the caveat, we're still only one year into the four year term. Uh, things, you know, could go either way. But uh, the way right. the, the the previous council term where no party had a majority things were getting more and more acrimonious as the term went on. Council was getting less and less functional. I mean, some of that was due 
you know, to COVID and then meetings moving online created all kinds of problems as people in all kinds of workplaces have seen that, you know, moving to online meetings was really convenient and helped a lot. But obviously there's, you know, inevitably some tech technical glitches and stuff when you have 10 counselors, a mayor, city clerks, a bunch of people on a meeting, uh, all in different locations, you know, fair enough. There were some technical glitches, but even beyond that, there were tensions and dysfunctions that were certainly flaring up over the course of last council term. This term so far, obviously, you know, there's differences of opinion and disagreements around the council chambers, but for the most part, the meetings seem to be quite functional and um, largely collegial. Um, so, you know, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll see how that continues and, you know, we'll see if the, if there is going to be more use of these code of conduct complaints and launches of formal investigations into things people have done or said. And, you know, I'm not sure how much the public likes that. If the public likes the idea of politicians, um, you know, launching these kinds of formal investigations against each other, uh, I guess it kind of depends on what the merits of each case are determined to be. Right. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned as we get into the second year of this four-year mandate. Thanks, Dan. Yep. We'll talk next week. Okay. Great. Thanks, Harold.